Hi, we are now broadcasting live for eTourism Summit Virtual. My name is Becca Smith. I am the Senior Director of Marketing and Events for Connect Travel. Thank you all for being here with us today. Um, for some of you, it might be your, your second session for the day. We had a very awesome session early, earlier on influencer marketing. So thanks for joining in again with us today. Um, I just wanted to share that this topic is actually really um, uh, near and dear to my heart as an event producer and event planner. Um, I think this is a really awesome conversation to have and um, really excited to hear what everyone has to contribute today. Um, we actually are kicking off some live and in-person events um, starting tomorrow um, and then also some events in November, November uh, 9th through 10th in Orlando. And you can actually click the top of your chat to learn a little bit more about those events. Um, I know we're all eager to see everybody uh, meet face to face and just, you know, kind of be how it used to be, but we're making the best of it um, doing virtual and it's still always great to see your names pop up and have uh, familiar faces. So um, that's actually a really great segue and for me to introduce our moderator and sponsor for today, Stephanie Davis Smith with Connect. Thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah. Yeah, and so we are looking forward to the discussion. Um, it's going to be a really great one. We've got some awesome panelists. Um, we have one other panelist who's going to hop in in a few minutes, but I'll go ahead and kick it over to Stephanie. And again, thank you all for being with us today. Thank you, Becca. And Becca, you stole my line because I was <laughs> going to say this is really close to my heart too because <laughs> I worked for Connect and we um, – have conferences, magazines, websites, and social media that serve meeting, the meeting planner industry and event producer. So our advertisers are DMOs, CVBs, hotels and venues that want to connect with meeting planners and event professionals. So this topic, who's passionate about virtual everything? Nobody. Um, I loved. So anyway, I am Stephanie Davis Smith. I'm the VP of content and marketing at Connect. And so uh, I handle all our social media teams, our marketing team, as well as all of our editorial content. So I'm sure this topic is near and dear to the hearts of our panelists as well, since they've decided to join us, which I appreciate. So I'm going to let them each introduce themselves and share a little of their background and kind of what point of view they're coming from in this whole um, group that we put together. So I will start with Sonia Bradley, the CMO of Visit Sacramento. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, yes, I'm Sonia Bradley. I am the Chief Marketing Officer for Visit Sacramento, which means I oversee all the marketing for uh, Visit Sacramento and all our family of brands, we like to call them. And uh, for our purposes, given during this pandemic, our, our primary focus is on the meetings market and how we can best serve our customers, despite what we're all going through and always trying to look for creative ways to reach out, engage with them and reach out to them and Ensure we ensure they know that uh, Sacramento is is ready for them when they're when when we're ready. California's still on lockdown, so we're just always preparing for that. Thanks. Thanks, Sonia. And then we have Maya Sternsey, the co-founder of Digital Edge Marketing. Hi. Thank you so much for having us today. Um, Digital Edge is a B2B focused meetings marketing agency that works with DMOs on their group sales and meetings marketing efforts. So we try to help DMOs be innovative and utilize digital marketing to reach a good manner, which is definitely a new and um, different kind of challenge this year. So really helping everyone pivot to virtual and these kind of platforms and still have relevancy keeping their names out there. So I appreciate it. I love your background. The background is so cool. <laughs> it's like, I need a wall for a wall. Um, and then Jacqueline, I just saw you come in and I'm hoping you're still there. Jacqueline Bernstein is on the floor of Connect right now. And she's the owner of Empire Force Events. And she may have gone out. I don't see her anymore. I see her coming back. Let's see. Jacqueline, can you hear us? Having a remote political advisor, something during the debate. I love it. Can you hear us? Yeah. Okay, great. We hear you. Why don't you go ahead and tell them kind of. I hear you. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I think I'm going to turn this off. So you do hear me? Yes. Okay, so wow, this is why we're not liking virtual, right? <laughs> Everything was all working just before we started, and now it just didn't. But I'm excited to be here because I am actually speaking to you live from the Connect Show, live Yay. in Orlando. 
So it's very exciting. Actually, this is going to be the first national live show. So I'm very excited and honored to be here, also in conjunction with BizBash. So thank you for having me here. As far as who I am with the introductions, I was too busy with technology, but I think that's what we're up to right now. I'm Jacqueline Bernstein. I own Empire Force Events, and we are an event production and destination manager company based in New York City. We are the longest independently and locally owned DMC in New York City, servicing New York City, State, New Jersey, Connecticut, wherever you want to go. I'm honored to be here because I sit on the board of NYC and Company, which is a destination marketing organization of New York City. And I think I come with a different perspective because I'm the one that's looking what others are doing and I'm hearing what others are doing. So I hope that I'm able to add to and to what we're going to do here and just connect with all of you. So thank you for dealing with my technical difficulties and having me. I love it, Jacqueline. That is perfect. It definitely illustrates why virtual can be tough and the pivoting we're all doing. So as she was saying, we're watching to see who are the most creative people in this field. What are they doing? What are destinations doing to get event marketers there, to get events there? And, um, what are we doing during this time of kind of hybrid events or no live events at all? So who would like to jump in first with something they've seen that's super creative um, out of our panelists? And I can call on you as well. <laughs> um, well, I can share one. Um, we work with Explore Branson and they did a virtual fam tour and they took a different spin by having people live um, on location. And so they went to a golf course that's opening and they were shooting from the golf course even had somebody driving around the golf cart explaining why this product is important to groups that will be coming here and then they had someone um, out on a lake with a drone flying and having the coverage on the drone so it was just a really nice different take that while we're going to be virtual we can still be creative and still bring a place to life. Um, so that was a really cool thing that we saw. And I also think that what St. Louis is doing with their advertising, um, they're really promoting how their convention center and facilities are touchless. And so I think it kind of lends to all of us looking at things from a different light, like even just walking your spaces and having this new mindset that is, you know, what is touchless? What different types of protocols can you put in place? And how can you get that message out there creatively? So those are two examples that I kind of liked. I love that too. And Jacqueline, we can hear the background, which is not a bad thing. I'm kind of like living vicariously through you since I'm not there. So in between, do you want to mute? Just yes. Sorry but I about want that. You to talk and share a story if you have something creative you've seen. Well, I'm actually just going to jump in real quick since I have the floor before I, I don't want to touch anything. That's why I'm still not on mute. Um, <laughs> What's interesting for me is that because we're an event production company and that we want to do everything live as much as we can, what we've experienced is the combination of something virtual in this format, whether it be simply as a venue or a vendor or a hotel walking with their iPhone doing a FaceTime or taking the time and effort, and obviously that costs money, which is challenging at this time to actually do a prefab video, but they're combining it with, I guess what we're all calling now a micro event or the gifting where we're going to walk you through our hotel, let's say, or these great venues in our destination. But prior to that, we've sent to your home office some elements of a food and beverage, something to wear, something for you to play with. And we're finding that's where companies like mine come into play, where we get to get involved with that. So we're finding as much as that we're all connecting like this um, in this virtual realm, that something that they can touch and feel and maybe taste, okay, and have a cocktail with is helping bring that experience alive for the participant that has to do this virtually. Nothing obviously is ever going to replace just walking through the actual venue or destination, but something that's just added and made it just seem a little more eventful has been part of the experience. So I'm sure many of you out there have done this. I know many destinations have done this. I know hotels do this. But I think that as we move forward in this, and it's good to, as I'm in the Northeast, it's going to get colder, more wintry, you really can't then potentially travel with every, everything else that's going on with the pandemic. The gifting and making it like a micro event. We've all been hearing that terminology, that it might be 20 people, 200 people watching it, or even just you, that it gives you some sort of live experience. I, I, so experienced Kissimmee sent me this whole alcohol kit, even this orange in a bag to make a drink while I chat with them next week to kind of hear what's going on in experience Kissimmee. So I know, Sonia, you're in a destination as well. Visit Sacramento. Have you guys done anything or seen anything creative in that space? 
Um, well, actually, I'm fortunate to have uh, uh, Maya's digital ed is our agency, so uh, we haven't quite got to the level of virtual sales, but those are things that we've talked about. I mean, for us, it's um, we have a uh, new expanded and renovated convention center coming online in several months. So on the one hand, we were, I'll use the word fortunate that the building was down during 2020, but it will be back again in several months. And of course, we don't know where things are going to be. Uh, and California is still in lockdown. So that's been really tough for us to get customers here. So for us, has been sort of we, um, and then we have had hotels who've been short on staff. So a lot of it's really just been um, staying in touch with our customers. That has been the main thing. But over the last few months, we've certainly created a new animated video so people can see what the convention center will look like once it's open. We're actually, like right now, I have someone shooting some virtual video for us so they can see the proximity of the hotels to the uh, convention center. So in, in some respects, we're still on our plan, if you will, our strategy for opening the marketing and communications for the convention center. But given this pandemic, we certainly want to try some creative ways. I think um, I foresee us doing a perhaps a webinar. I definitely, with, again, with Maya on our, on our team, being able to do that virtual fan will be key because Sacramento is also a destination that while this profile has risen in, in over the last several years, people are still unsure of you know what to expect when they get there. We're America's farm to port capital. So that even actually makes it tough because you know they can't quite get taste of fresh food unless they're here. But we want to be able to ex be able to bring that to our customers in some virtual format. And certainly it could be called uh, rely on some shipping. Um, and if you're at Connect, um, we had our, uh, we did something very simple. We, we know people aren't necessarily taking materials, so we will have our QR code out there on the lunch tables so people can, uh, you know, uh, see a little bit more about the convention center expansion. So those are some of the areas that we're tapping into right now. But again, we're leading up to the opening of that convention center. I love it. Jacqueline, you may want to I've seen I've seen some really cool drive-in experiences where they have you drive through their destination, like in a parking lot or in a park, and you know do pop-ups or or characters dancing just to kind of get people to know about their their destination, their venue. I've also seen um, some really great email activations with. Um, cams like webcams live webcams of what's going on in the city and you can kind of virtually look and see what people are doing walking around the city at the beach whatever the destinations kind of highlights are and being in the magazine industry and seeing these things and kind of gathering together i've seen people get really creative especially with drive-in especially with boat in anything they can do where it's an outdoor activity have you guys seen anything like that jacqueline or maya yeah, I've even seen where um, salespeople have hit the road and gone from one city to the other and set up in a parking lot and said, come visit me here. And, you know, I'll give you some coffee and socially distanced. And so everything um, is kind of that way where they're going to the clients because, you know, we're all road warriors. We, we miss traveling. We miss hosting. And so I think anytime you can create that connection, um, one tip I would give destinations when they're doing any of these kind of virtual experience is make it an experience. Don't make it just like a site tour with the space, but kind of showcase the destination and create that appeal and what makes your destination unique and different and try to bring that to life um, any way you can, whether it's drive through or you're showing up in a city and meeting in parking lots, you know, um, whatever you can do to create that pizzazz that makes your destination um, kind of sizzle and really showcase what your unique selling proposition is. I think that's always really important to make sure you focus around that. Jacqueline, I know you have live events coalition too, but you go ahead and say what you're going to yes, say. I have two things I wanted to say because I'm here at the Connect Show, and it's funny, and I'm just going to mention this. My hair was nice and straight early, but it's pouring here in Orlando. So now I'm looking at myself all frizzy. I am literally about two feet away from it pouring raining. So this this has truly been a crazy virtual experience for me. I, I, I have to admit, I also have my bikini top on already from the pool today. So we we're trying to really make this a great experience for you, but here I am inside. We're You're very talking to you. You're very Florida. I'm very real. You must have heard that, that I was going to be a very real speaker for you. So with that being said, I love what you just mentioned, Maya, about 
making that a real experience because one of the clients that I saw here earlier today when I told her what I'm going to be presenting on, I asked her what she really enjoyed that, that she experienced in these virtual uh, kind of site inspections, et cetera. And she said that she liked that if she'd never seen the hotel before, they weren't just focused on their meeting space, et cetera. They actually walked around the hotel and gave her the idea of the venue, of uh, the destination. Now, granted, and that's something I think in any destination, if you're going to talk about your hotels, walk them into that hotel. Don't forget about the experience of the access and the egress and what the neighborhood is all about. Even though someone might have seen the hotel before, they might want to see how the neighborhood might have might have changed. I mean, we've all seen cities and destinations changing throughout this time frame. To be able to explain to them, here's the new restaurant that popped up. Well, look at the outdoor dining that's having happening at the restaurant, which is very prevalent now, let's just say in my city of New York. But when you also talk about live event experiences, great segue, Stephanie, so thank you, is that I am the executive vice president of the Live Events Coalition, which I hope many of you know that the Live Events Coalition came about by a petition, dot, what, no, change.org petition that went online social media back in March about only 500,000 of us in the events, travel, hospitality, tourism, et cetera, industry signed on to. And then they formulated the coalition specifically for awareness and advocacy in order for hopefully our legislators and Congress will pass something that will take care of us with the next stimulus act. And the Live Events Coalition aligned with US travel and was very active in getting the reform flexibility bill passed when it went from eight weeks to 24 weeks for the uh, PPP program. Um, the payroll protection program. So yes, we are a legit organization and we are fighting for advocacy. And the first live national um, empty event that you might have all seen the empty events around the country with signage. The first live one was in New York. I must say because of my connections with NYC and company, we were able to get the ask and Times Square Alliance gave us Times Square to do our event. If you're going to come to the epicenter of New York, the positive epicenter, you want to be in Times Square. <laughs> So we were honored to be able to do that live event. And then I figured, why stop there? I asked for Godzilla, the largest billboard in Times Square on top of the New York Marriott Marquis, and they give us an hour programming time. Then we took it a step further a month or so later and lit the Empire State Building red. So there are a lot of great event live activations you can do. And tying in with watching everything virtually, although we did the event live for the advocacy and the media and hopefully the legislators to see it, we, there is a live webcam in Times Square. So those people were able to watch that through the Times Square Alliance and see what was happening with our event. And then of course we did do a Facebook live activation. So as much as that we all want to try to be organized and perfect, and maybe when you're doing that, when I say for a client and their actual virtual event, in order to get there to sell the destination, to sell your hotel, having a little fun with it, like I just did with the technical uh, hiccups and showing you my bathing suit straps in rainy Orlando right now, that gives the real live experience. That's what we would do if we were on a site inspection anyway. So why not incorporate that when we're doing it virtually and make you feel that you're real personable, personable as well as personal, maybe even when you're not. But that's Thank you, Stephanie, for letting me talk about Live Events Coalition because we are fighting for everyone in this profession to be protected, not when we get to the other side, but to survive to the other side. I'm so glad you got with this group. And I think also a takeaway from that is go big, ask big, ask for Times Square, ask for the biggest billboard in your town, ask for something that you might not have gotten in a different time period because now people are ready to help. There's got to be creativity. There, There's things you may not have thought about that you could you could do. So I thought that was a great um, example. And so my favorite question I always ask is kind of what are some of the don'ts that you're seeing from marketers marketing an event, marketing their destination where you're like, eesh. Um, and you don't have to name names, but just a couple, just the don'ts sometimes are fun to know and make sure we don't make missteps. Does anyone want to talk about that? It doesn't have to be about you. It can be something you've seen. <laughs> something you've thought about doing and then ran down the pipe and you're like, no, that's not well, good. Well, I'll, I'll start. I mean, it's, it's sort of your, it's early on in the pandemic, um, it was, at first, it's, we knew we had to pivot, but sometimes you sort of fall back on old uh, routines. And so, for uh, admittedly, for probably, you know, a few weeks, few months, I kept thinking, okay, we have to do such and such, like just a simple email newsletter and you want to send it out, but and you're thinking, well, you do it now, you, you know, when do you do it? And you realize people's patterns have changed on what, how they're uh, um, digesting information. 
So for me, it was a rethinking of how do you get information to people in a, in a completely different space? I mean, even the data that we're getting um, isn't, isn't always very clear. So it's a, it's a lot of uh, sort of testing, if you will, trial and error, if you will. And so to be honest, I still think I'm doing trial and error, and I think we'll be doing trial and error during this entire pandemic. But for me, I, I know I had to rethink just some of the tactics that we were doing um, because either they wouldn't work or they just, we just need to shift at them a little. So in that vein, you know, fortunately I didn't, I don't think I did anything huge, but it was just, it really was a matter of, like I said, pivoting to where our customers are, given that everyone's life has shifted. I got to unmute before I'm talking. Um, I think that's a good point too, is right in the beginning, I think a lot of us were waiting for the bell curve to come down. And so we were just waiting for a couple weeks. You know, in my company, we talked, oh, a couple weeks, we'll all go into lockdown a few weeks and we'll be back. And how do we market? So then I had to figure out how to market a live event to our meeting planners um, in the middle of this. And how, basically we focused on safety and cleanliness. That became our driving force. We can meet again. We can meet safely again. And telling stories of people that have met safely, um, whether it's 20 people, 50 people. I think we've done one story of somebody up to 150 people. This Connect event is you know, 800 to 1,000 people and marketing to them to deal with every single you know, I don't want to say this in a, like every single um, thing they might be afraid of or scared of tackling that in a different way for each person became our marketing messaging. You know, it just couldn't be the same as it was, you know, back in February when we had our great event in Florida too. So with, I'll stop talking about my event, but who else has seen a, a don't? I think um, one don't I see is there's two examples. One, um, don't act like things haven't changed. So don't go back to market with the same message and the same campaign. Um, really adjust. Make sure that you're leading with that health and safety protocols and you're acknowledging the situation that we're all in. I think it's really important to identify that things are different um, and showcase how you're adapting with all of the rest of us. And then another thing is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to lead. Don't be afraid to go back out there. I really commend Connect for giving us a start and you know having an event. Um, Visit Indie has been a leader in coming back to market with messaging. So I think it's don't be afraid to go back to market and to be present and to be in the marketplace. It's we all need to have um, leaders within our organizations and tell everyone it's okay, that we need to be present. Um, it's gonna be different. It's gonna be a different message. It's gonna probably be a different budget, but we really need to be um, out there and keep a presence going. And I'll throw to you, Jacqueline, in a second. I wanted to say something. Visit Indy and uh, Explore St. Louis. The CMO of Explore St. Louis told me he's now an, an epidemiologist like expert. He also had to just ingrain himself in the science and the meadow and so that he could spread the message of what people were doing in his city. And I think that's the same for meeting planners or event marketers. Know what you're talking about. Get into it because people are counting on you to make them feel safe at the next event. But Jacqueline, go ahead. If you saw, don't. <laughs> you know, again, I had chatted with some clients while I, I've been here. I'm making use of this being live because I'm just going to have to go back home and you know sit with no shoes on and talk virtually again. Right. Um, the, client, the client actually had said that she did um, a virtual experience for her. And then when they called the hotel, they found the hotel had closed. And so she felt that as much as that you don't want to be talking about, unfortunately, the inevitable of closing, that if you're going to market out there, then you also need to. We enjoyed having you on our webinar last month. We thank you for your support, but unfortunately, we need to let you know that we have closed, as opposed to just having to find out on your own. So you have to relay that information. Um, so I think that's very important. And as far as talking about what else you need to see, you remember in the past, you didn't want to watch people cleaning in the hotel lobbies or seeing that. Now you want to see that. So I believe that if you are going to do that, vir that virtual site inspection, like right now you see me and I'm actually in the Marriott World Congress Center Hotel, it wouldn't be a bad thing if you saw someone masked right behind me. And I just took my mask off to speak. I'm a New Yorker. I, I'm a good mask wearer. But to see them actually cleaning, it's actually a bad don't if you don't show people cleaning at this point. 
It's very important to feel comfortable where you're at in any venue and to see that protocol happening. In the past, it was a no-no. You just thought it miraculously happened. Now it should be clean and you want to see it going ahead in that realm. And I know that you had speakers from NYC and company speak, I think, open up the session uh, for this the, uh, tourism summit. But I must say, as a New Yorker, if you can tell by the Brooklyn accent, that we are doing it all in. So if you are familiar with our campaign and what we're doing in New York City, they have taken it to the streets, literally. It's not just NYC and company doing it, but they're having other organizations really jump hard on the expression or pun intended, all in. And you're seeing people mass and doing the protocols and showing what New York City is like right now, that it's vital, it's living, and how it's going to progress as everyone starts coming back to us. I think that's very important. Any campaign that you're doing, showing what's going on and what you're going to be doing as you move on in the future. It's a reality. And bringing in partners, if it's people all over, all in, like getting people to buy into your new messaging. Um, I think that's a really good point. And so that segues into what is forever changed in this time of virtual events and hybrids and live events? What do you think we won't go back to? And do you think there will forever be virtual options now for everything? Who would like to speak first? Sonia, do you want to speak first? Uh, yeah, I absolutely believe it's forever changed. Um, for a couple, I think the main reason is if uh, to get more people to attend an event. I mean, it very well may be that uh, people are um, uh, priced out or the timing is bad. But I think just from a very practical reason, it may actually get, may actually get you more attendance. I think the ability to archive too and have people return to you know to either review a session or check it out um, also could be your selling point for getting people to attend in person. I know in our industry we, our friend, we love to be amongst you know each other. It's part of our it's part of our DNA in some sense. But I do think it's changed forever. Um, I think uh, the other thing I think we will rethink materials and things that we give out. Um, that that could totally be reduced from just a safety perspective and how many of us have realized some of the things we had we didn't really need. So it's that thing. I don't think that's going to take place. But in answer to your question, yeah, I, I, I do believe this changed forever. Remember when uh, we were all going to, there weren't going to be any more meetings? Remember that was going to be a few years ago? We were all going to be doing it like this. So now that we've got a taste of it, I think we're going to meet somewhere in the middle. Love that. And Maya, what do you think? What's forever changed? <laughs> I think it's definitely always going to have a hybrid approach. Um, you know, you've seen it, groups have record attendance and, you know, it's provided additional revenue streams for these events. And I think we're all going to need additional revenue streams moving forward. Um, so it's always going to have a hybrid component. And there's a really nice part of the hybrid component that gives you a virtual place to have engagement after the event. And that's something that has been sort of a um, problem that we've been looking for for a long time is how do you create those connections and keep them going after the events occur where people had those great relationships started and they want to continue them on. So I think the really good hybrid solutions are going to help keep that engagement happening after the event ends before the next event occurs. So it does provide um, a way to keep the engagement going and increase the revenue. Um, and then also we still want to meet in person. There's going to be a large number of us who are going to have key events that we're going to want to attend in person every year and then additional events that we're going to be able to attend now that we have hybrid solutions. Love that. Jacqueline, you agree? I see the head nodding. I agree. I'm nodding. I'm agreeing with everything that's being said. You're the experts, obviously, in this virtual world. I, as a live event producer, and obviously focus on a destination, how to acclimate. We, we, it's so strange for us to do what we do when it's always about connecting live. What I think has been interesting is that everything that we're talking with clients about now to come to come back when they do come live is going to have this hybrid component. The other, honestly, challenging part is clients that are going to be able to financially invest in both. I think a lot of clients just felt the corporate clients or the intermediary planning clients that we service were feeling, oh, well, it's easy. They're just at home. They're sitting there. It's easy. Just set up a camera. But it's not. Obviously, I was talking about the virtual challenge that we just had trying to get on a computer here to speak with all of you. So there is so much investment that's being done with sending 
green screen dress kits and maybe even setting up studios where people can go in a safe, comfortable format to be able to film, to be able to be filmed live and be able to transpose what the live experience is going to be on a virtual platform. So there's money that needs to be invested and that's what we're hoping that clients are going to realize as more events start opening up. What I do believe interesting outcome and out of adversity comes some positivity is just let's think about Becca typing that message to everyone here about again NYC and company think about when you've been on a zoom with maybe 40 people or 400 people and you go through the screen and you get to chat in that um, area that high that um, virtual area we might not have been able we, we definitely didn't you go to the reception you might go to one bar you might go to the other bar you would not be able to communicate with everyone so all the different platforms, I just mentioned Zoom, which is obviously at the simplest level, but all the different meeting platforms that are out there are giving an opportunity for the passive observer that might just be sitting at home and can't go. And I'm not saying they're so passive, but it's different than walking around at the event. It gives them a different way to communicate. I'm finding that even myself, and I'm sure you realize now I'm not shy and I can talk to anyone, I'm communicating with more people in this realm because I'm using the chat and the Q&A that I might have if we were in the ballroom at the reception. So it's an interesting concept that we're gonna to have to see how to balance both. I was fortunate last week to be at the, two weeks ago to be at the first live New York industry event where they had a speak there on a stage with partitions, masked, but there were 20 people in the audience and 400 people that watched it virtually. And what was a great experience is to, they could never have fit the 400 people all around the country. We obviously couldn't do it safely, um, but it was great to be in that situation. It was done by Nectar. I don't want to take away from Connect, but I think in this industry, we have to support everyone that is doing everything um, live. And I was honored to be a part of that. And I think we're going to see more of that. And obviously being here at Connect, connecting, you guys are the first one nationally doing it. We're going to see how it comes about. You should also know that we're you're giving here at Connect um, quick rapid testing on the day that we leave. And I think that's, I just wanted to mention that that is very, very important so that we're able to deal with the quarantine and the factor. I love that. And um, there was a big LA event where they did quick rapid testing uh, drive through and you kind of like got to your car and waited and you got a text saying if you could come into the live event, waited for that. And I thought that was really creative. And BizBash covered that story. So it's on their, they're our sister site. And when Stephanie, yes, uh, you know, the a thought also occurred to me. I know we spent a lot of time talking about how do we bring um, the next generations into some of our, whether it's our industry, whether it's our associations, whatever it is. And I think this could be the tipping point for ensuring that we're bringing up not just the next, the next generation, but people who, you know, when they were born, technology was at their fingertips and it's, it's, it's easy for them. Like it's not, it's, it's not, it's not uh, foreign to them. And so again, I don't, I think we're also learning that human connection is just as important, but I, I do think that we could potentially start seeing that millennial and Gen Z coming in through the ranks, maybe a little quicker than we hadn't seen in the past. So I, I again, I think we're going to find that middle ground that will add to our rank. Yeah, they're very comfortable in this space and they, and they can figure things out fast. And we're like, okay, this new virtual platform like Big Marker, which is what we're on today, Becca did an amazing job with our designer figuring out how to make it look like a space to you guys that you're existing in this e-tourism summit um, kind of platform. But that's a really good point that it can bring in new audiences too that are really comfortable in this space. Um, one thing you were saying, Jacqueline, and it made me think of some people that were doing really, oh, so virtual platform, not just looking at it like a Zoom, there's some really great, uh, some organizations that have used basically people that put on live events to make this experience of a virtual event feel like they're at a show. And I've seen them with the behind the scenes cameras and the studios, and they're actually queuing people up and saying, go, go, go. And it's, it's like watching a real sh live show. And I've been really impressed. Some of the other platforms I love um, that I've been a part of are Slido, which is very interactive for a virtual platform. If you're looking for something that is interactive um, I thought that was an incredible one, but, uh, I even saw Houston made a studio in their convention center and it's called, it's near the Avenida or something. So people are getting creative and they're getting creative fast. Um, there's no time to wait kind of vibe. Uh, I thought that was great. Is there anything else you guys have seen like that where they're treating the event like virtual, but also a show? 
Anyone seen that? Like IMAX, you know, just did their entire thing as the underwater experience. I mean, it, it's just interesting to see people do that. Go ahead, Maya, you unmuted. Do you want to speak? Absolutely. I see a lot of um, commenters and hotels trying to create that hybrid solution, you know, like Houston, where they went and they built out a hybrid studio space to really make it easy to do that. And I think that is definitely a trend that's here to stay, you know, upgrading Wi-Fi capabilities and making sure the destination is ready for this new normal um, when we come out of it. So I think any of those hybrid solutions and anywhere the destination can really identify what solutions are taking place within your community and then and looking at how you can market that different solution and get that message out there in new ways is important. Jacqueline, I see you. Unmute. I'm not as quick as someone that's about 20 minutes younger than me to do the unmute on my computer. So what's <laughs> how I keep it relevant and real. Right. But what I'm finding interesting is that separate from the convention centers, and I know that um, Javits Center in New York is also have their studio is that there are still people that are not necessarily comfortable going out for whatever reasons it may be and even go to that studio and be separated from people. So there are a lot of the production companies I know we work with and there are so many out there that have been so innovative with the platforms but are also making it easier for those at home to not necessarily use whether it be one of those green backdrops where you put your hands up on Zoom and then you know your hands go away, or even just your home, and sending them green screen kits, as I mentioned earlier, to enable them to be able to make it seamless. You know, it's almost as if we're working, we're living and working in a world now that looks everything like a TV broadcast for the news, and we want to try to make it look seamless. And I, you know, if there's a technical glitch, we all get uh, past it. But we all need to try to think innovatively. We've also worked with some clients where we're actually building something for them or doing live florals or whatever it may be. And even when your destinations, we talked about this earlier, are looking to engage people who want to pick your destinations or your hotel, having live entertainment is just a background, just it's like texture for that. So there's a lot of ways to do it. And if some people are just not going to be comfortable traveling to a studio, that you can look to your, and I must put a plug, your event production destination manager partners to help bridge that gap and make it live, but not really, but live in this virtual format. Like um, virtual escape room team building where people lead an escape room kind of quiz. I've seen a clue, like kind of mystery dinner theater team building event where you take it kind of to the next level instead of just the cocktail hour, which by the way is fun. I do like that. Or watching a bartender. Visit Oakland is doing that for us where they have a bartender live streaming how to make the cocktail for you. And I know other destinations have done that, but it's, it is kind of fun on your side to be like, we're all making this, we're taking pictures. Um, okay. So moving on to a new question for those marketers and event planners and event professionals that want to hide out and kind of stop communicating. And I've heard people say, well, I'm just going to hibernate, you know, for a little while. What do you say to those people? Go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, um, don't stand in the background. You know, I know everyone's got a different situation and different budget, but there's a lot that you can do using your own channels. You know, just like we can all be broadcasters um, in virtual settings, we also have our websites, our social channels, our email databases, a lot of tools that are just at our own um, disposal that we can utilize. And there's a lot of research that's been done from the 2008 recession that shows that if you kind of turn everything off, your ability to regroup and recuperate is much less than those who maintain some sort of a presence. So we've been working with a lot of our clients on creating a phased approach where they're really using their own channels to get started and get a message going and have some sort of presence and then building from there as you can with budget. But you definitely still have an amazing destination to market and those destinations definitely have a need for group business. You know, leisure is keeping many of us alive, but it's not going to make us solvent in the long term. It's going to require group business returning. And if you want that to return in a timely fashion, you have to be present. You have to have an awareness and you really just can't hide out. Um, and it's very difficult. I understand that many destinations are dealing with loss of staff, um, you know, hotels still being closed and things of that nature. But 
Um, I think we've all learned to pivot and be creative. So do what you can with what you have, um, even if it's in small doses, but be present um, in any way possible. I love that. Sonia, you want to go? Sure. I mean, I, I can just echo with uh, what Maya said. I, you know, again, in the beginning, it was, you, you just didn't really didn't know. And, and particularly in here in California, where we, we were one of the first to lock down early on and everything, you know, went and literally went haywire for us. But um, to, to Maya's point, you, your own channels are the best way to go. We, um, I mean, even for us, it was just a simple matter of let's just restart the newsletter. I mean, we had stopped it because we didn't know what what were we going to say. Like, you know, the sky was falling. So, um, but it was just a simple newsletter, but being consistent with it and something, you know, I, I always have to remind myself, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, it just, you just need to get, get something out to know that one, you're thinking of the customer and two, that we're going to be here again when things are back to some sem semblance of normalcy. But um, as time went on and things started to settle, and all I say, we just sort of settle into a new routine. And so we continue to add to, you know, our strategies that we're moving forward with. And again, with the um, convention center opening, we have great products to showcase. I mean, that actually makes it a little bit easier for us because we can just keep sending construction pictures if we want. So that works in our favor. But yeah, I just echo what Maya said, a lot of that, but um, just just whatever you can do is, is really, is really the best way to, is, is really the best way to go. You can't, you just can't hide, even though I know many days we want to, but we just can't do it. I hear you on that. Okay, Jacqueline, do you want to chime in? Yes. There are a lot of people laughing here and they're connect people. So let them laugh, right? It's a good thing. It feels good. Um, you know, I've been very, very vocal in our profession, in our industry, because of my fighting for the, for the Live Events Coalition advocacy. But I'm also not shy to cry about the loss of revenue as a business owner, that our whole business is about live experiences, right, in our destination. And I grapple with every day, how does a business stay in business that doesn't do business? So for me, it's been a lot about staying relevant. And I don't necessarily feel that what we're doing right now is not live. We're live, but we're not touching feeling live. But we're talking to each other live way before the pandemic. You remember February back, you know, the good old days? I would always tell our team when we were trying to speak to a client to stop that emailing back and forth. When do you want to speak? I'm available tomorrow. What are your hours? I would say just pick up the phone. Now we're picking up the phone, but guess what? Do you actually have a lot of real phone calls anymore on a phone? When you say, let's meet, we all do at minimum a Zoom meeting, right? It almost seems awkward to just actually talk to someone, let's on your cell on the go somewhere, but to not have this live experience. I'm thinking this is here to stay. This is how we're just gonna have a small conversation about something, but be able to make it into something else. So I don't feel that the hibernating is the way to go. I'm trying to keep my business relevant. And uh, this is not a plug. I'm sharing this with everyone that if you want to be relevant still in the industry, just at least being out there, that's a phrase that I use and doing what we're doing is a way to stay relevant. And if you're connecting with your clients, I think a lot of people are just calling clients and calling vendors and just checking in. And that connectivity is going to God willing beget something. Hey, so and so that caterer called me. I haven't spoken in a while, but today someone called me for an event. That's what we did in the olden days, but now more than ever is what we really need to do and not hibernate and not just to wait to sit out because it's not going to just end this way. As we talked about earlier, being in this format hybrid is what we're going to do. And I don't even like to use the word pivot. I know everyone else says, I like to say we're shaking it up. We're doing something different. You know, pivot would be if I left this profession. I have no idea what else would I would do. The company I own, I worked at when I got graduated college and then I bought it. So what else am I going to do? And there's so much in this hospitality profession to give and we're fighting for. We keep seeing in the news about gatherings being illegal, um, unauthorized, a, a super spreader, but we're in the gathering business. So we have to still keep putting it out there so God willing it'll come back and we have, we have something to do. Thank you for saying that, yeah. That is exactly it. And I, on my side, so we have a lot of clients that pulled, um, obviously they've lost revenue, they've lost um, staff. And so they started pulling all their advertising 
whether it was email blasts that we do to our meeting planners, whether it was sponsoring the show that was coming up or anything, just they started to pull back saying, what's the point of this year? But then we started hearing from the planners, hey, now I have to put this on the back end of the year. I have to put this in Q1, even if we don't know what's happening. So we were like, you still want to be talking to them. You still want to be emailing them. Um, what's a cheap way that we can do something for you? And so our sales team would reach out to them and say, can we do social media for you? Can we, you can do that with partners in your industry, people that have similar audiences. You can begin to partner with people you maybe wouldn't have back in another time. But like you said, Nectar, like happy to promote anybody that's doing anything in our space because we, we know all boats rise if we go together. So it's just been really interesting to watch as some of those partnerships go and those walls get broken down. But it was it was interesting when they when they paused and then they started again and their open rates on their emails went from you know 13, 14% to 21, 24%. And they're like, well what what do you think the difference is? And I was like, people <laughs> just want to communicate. They just want to hear from you. So do it in a creative way. Send them a gifting option. Like we said, there's just some really interesting ways to do that. Gifts for the good life. If you guys, they're one of my favorite, like eye candy, uh, gifting box kind of groups. And they do them for all kinds of, um, things that they did a lot of, uh, pandemic kind of boxes for people. Like we're checking on your health. We're checking on your mental health. Here are some fun things for you. And, that's something you could always give to a meeting planner. We're looking, you know, looking to work with you again and hope you're doing okay. So I've seen some creative things. Again, gifts for the good life is eye candy for meeting planners. It's just so fun. Um, okay. So we are about 14 minutes out. Um, I wanted to open it up to any Q and A or questions anyone should have. You can put it in the chat box or, or in the Q and A. Um, we have a nice little group of people. We'll see if they have any questions or, or they can share any of their own stories of things they've seen. Um, wait, let me see. Oh, Becca Smith says, I much prefer shaking it up to pivot. I needed a new word too, because if I say pivot or new normal one more time, somebody slapped me. So <laughs> glad I have a new phrase that I can use. While we're waiting for some Q&A or chat, if nobody comes in, I do have another question. Let me get this. So um, in the early days of, of, of COVID, we did see people pivot or change. Was there anything, anybody you saw do something completely different? I know Jacqueline, you said you did gifting, but was there anything we saw completely different? Um, pivot, I used it. See, how did think people shake it up and do something completely different? Any good examples of that? Go for it, Jacqueline. Instead of just the actual gift that's mailed, what we're doing are little micro events where, and it obviously is going to depend on the client's investment and what you're actually giving, where we're setting up right outside their home table with the food presentation shrink wrap so they can see the food as opposed to being all boxed up. So we have the servers there to pour champagne. Okay, they are going to be in engraved Tiffany glasses. This, this client was investing in that. Have a floral arrangement so they can take and keep. So sometimes doing a little mini event where they're able to come outside their door, we're orchestrating that's going to happen at many different executives' homes at the exact same time, and then they're going to take everything inside, and then they're going to be able to go onto a Zoom platform and enjoy that meal together. Or it could be a destination that's doing this. Again, it might just be a can full, 10. You might not do that for 110, but if you're able to do that and give that live experience, we're going to have two servers there, masked, branded, gloved, and we're actually going to have, this will be during the holiday season, carolers behind them. And then when they come onto the Zoom, we can have live entertainment that's not imposing, that's kind of just playing a little background music in one of the Zoom boxes, so to speak. But there's a different way to give that approach as opposed to feeling, I'm just going to send someone a bottle of wine to their house. Imagine if someone's there to actually pour it for them and then they get to enjoy it. So again, speak to your DMO organizations, which I know is a major focus here, as well as speak to their members at our event production and destination management companies to help orchestrate that for you. We're all trying to be very innovative because as much as we have to be virtual, we're trying to still get that touchy-feely experience from six feet. And it's not social distancing, it's physical distancing because we are in a social profession. So keep that in mind. 
I love that. I was just going to share, we have a client, um, they are putting together a virtual fam and part of it is doing a charcuterie board demonstration. And so, you know, all of us at home, you, we go to create the nice charcuterie board with the cheeses and the meats and all that. And it never looks like it does, you know, when you see these Pinterest pages or you go to an event. So they're going to have a tutorial and um, demonstrate how to do it and how to set it up. A local restaurant is hosting it. So it's got that local tie. And then they're mailing everyone that participates a branded board to use at home. So I just thought that was like a fun, interactive, engaging way. And it ties into the local community. And it also keeps everybody, um, you know, trying to figure out how to create these Pinterest-like activities at home. <laughs> I love that. And I want somebody to come set up in my front yard and like make me dinner and do that. I mean, that could even be an incentive, you know, kind of experience for people that can't travel on the incentive market. Hire some, you know, high end restaurant to come and do it in your front yard and leave it there for you and, and go. I love that idea, Jacqueline. Very good. Cool. And just real quickly with that, especially for the holidays, we've also suggested someone coming and decorating in their front yard with fake snow and building a snowman and putting you know the color of their company's scarf or a top hat on so start thinking just ways you could do that for any of the seasons and i love maya that idea of teaching how to make something that's better than what it looks on pinterest that's very very smart <laughs> uh, sonia were you did you want to add anything you're muted there you go yeah i have to find a pointer <laughs> Um, I, I actually, it's from a completely different industry, but the thing I've noticed, um, with some, particularly, um, some of the smaller companies is how they're putting out, um, useful content. So if you follow them for anything, or, you know, there's a product that they sell that they've actually, you know, been offering, you know, complimentary, um, you know, education or something, you know, ultimately it hopefully leads down the line to, for them, additional revenue. But I have found, you know, a couple places, a couple things that um, I've been following for years, and they've just offered these sort of educational sessions that I've found useful, and it has nothing necessarily to do with our industry. But there's some other, you know, bits and pieces that I pick up. But I, I like how they've all sort of jumped in and did something to help shake up their business to also help them drive revenue. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I would say I have been getting a lot of people asking that are thought leaders and they're saying, I've written this article about this, or I have these talking points. And I, I have used those stories sometimes that on things I wouldn't normally have taken also because, you know, we're all short staffed too. So if you're writing an article and you're seeing something, you should start sending that out to people to try to get um, some traction on it. And then likewise with DMOs reaching out and saying, you know, we started to see this trend. Here's two or three planners that have done this trend, or we are starting to see this trend and we're part of it. We have the GBAC uh, accreditation and so do these four other places, obviously not competitive cities, but just kind of being a thought leader or content producer is a really interesting way. I think people have spent their time wisely during the pandemic when they have downtime and also kind of gathering these stories and getting inspiration and then sharing it. Um, with their with their audience. So I think that's a really good idea or a really smart move, Sonia. So thanks for sharing that. Anyone else want to jump in with anything? Let me see if I got any questions. We're so good that nobody has any questions for us. We are answering all their questions <laughs> before they even have them. Um, uh, I wanted to say too, okay, so I have all these other questions. I'm like, that may not be, was there anything you guys wanted to brag a little bit that you've done um, that I didn't get to or that you're like excited about? I mean, Jacqueline could brag about Live Events Coalition and, and she didn't mention that LA did one too and DC um, that were, you know, widely shared on social media, lighting up things red all around the country. Um and who came up with that idea, Jacqueline? Was that you getting together with some other event producers? Or so the, the, the Live Events Coalition came up with the empty events because we were all about awareness to be captured by the media and then hopefully for legislators to see and the politicians to be able to vote to protect us because that's the empty events. The, the Red Alert Restart actually came from a aligned organization called We Make Events. And they were predominantly, although they're in the live events space, 
which is we're all in the hospitality space together. But the uh, we make events with predominantly those that are involved with uh, productions, a lot of uh, gig workers, a lot of concerts, those type of live events as opposed to let's say a corporate event, a convention center, um, stage hands, etc. And they came up with that idea to line up uh, theater venues, and then we jumped on the bandwagon. And besides lining up Madison Square Garden, which they got in New York, we figured let's line up Empire State Building. But that's exactly it. All these organizations are aligning together now. You talk about DMOs, of which, again, I'm active with, but I'm a DMC. We all need to align together because we need to, one, promote, I hate to use the word sell, obviously the live experience in conjunction with hybrid, promote our destinations. All of our destinations are different, obviously opening and restrictions that we all need to be experts on the DMOs, and then utilizing your local partners and en able to sell it, promote it, Again, shaking it up there. And then also to welcome everyone back in a safe environment. And we also keep in mind there are some people that just don't necessarily feel that they can exhibit live or do anything live. And we should be very respectful of that. They might have elderly parents at home that they just can't do it for. So those trade show formats where you can sit and click on and you can, you can physically sit at the space, but then have someone virtual on a computer in this format, that's just going to be I don't want to say new normal. That's our world now. That's our new world. And let's just embrace it and go forward and just figure out how we're going to do it safely and hopefully productive and successfully. Yes, that also means financially for all of us. One thing you said that I think a lot of people need to get on board on is embracing this instead of waiting for it to go back. So a lot of people I feel like are waiting for things to go back and they need to embrace that things have changed and kind of find their way in the space. I think if you're hanging out, waiting, then like Maya said, like don't be in the background. Don't be doing that as a marketer. You, you look like you were going to say something, Maya. Um, I'll just build off of that. You know, we've had some clients get a campaign ready and go to market and then get backlash and criticism for a meetings campaign from the local community who doesn't really understand that um, these events are for not like they're for the future. They're not for tomorrow. And um, that, you know, when your destination is open, um, some because some destinations are wide open and they don't have a lot of restrictions they are able to host events and they're getting some backlash from within their local community about that and so i think it is difficult i think that we need to be supportive of each other within your own community when you do move forward with an event create our campaign create messaging to the partners and to the stakeholders so they understand why you're moving forward with this campaign um, what it is for how you're making sure that you're doing so in a safe manner. Um, because I think those who have kind of been out there first have had some backlash locally and it makes it tough to be a leader. So definitely find ways that you can create that support to step in and kind of counteract some of that negativity when you do go back to the market and you do have the messaging um, for the group business. So for me, having to move from Las Vegas, was we moved from New Orleans to Las Vegas to Orlando, following who was opening, because let me tell you, nobody on our team wanted to do that, not all the way from our CEO down, but we had kind of made this promise that we would be the first ones back out. We are in this industry, we're going to start out. I got not a ton, but backlash on social media when I posted it, and my response was, there are just people that are ready and then there are people that aren't. So the people that are ready can go and they feel comfortable and we're going to make it safe and clean for them to do it. We're going to use every strategy we can figure out. We're going to find every innovation and show it to all the meeting planners. And if you want to come and watch that virtually and see them do it and, you know, kind of that's how we had to market it. So I definitely dealt with the backlash of that and also moving an event a month before to an entirely new destination was brand new for me as a marketer. And so we held on to a lot of people, but we lost a lot of people who were comfortable with the drive market to Vegas. And we picked up a lot of people in the Southeast who were ready for that. Um, when you were talking about red, uh, lighting things red, red alert, I was just thinking and whole destination could do green for go. Let's light up. We're ready to go. We're ready to host you, you know, something like that and have all the partners that are in on it, you know, want to go too. Like you can just start using that kind of, we're open for business. I think we all got tired of the, we're in this together language that we saw from marketing events and, ev and marketing everything during COVID, the together line. But, um, there's new ways to say that, that we are, you know, coming together as partners and working together. Um, see, I can't even come up with anything off the top of my head, but 
Um, there are creative ways to do this. And I know we have one minute left. So I just wanted to thank everyone. And maybe I'll put you on the spot. What's like the one word that is describing your life and what you're in right now and how you're coping? <laughs> if you got one word to describe and we'll close on that. Maya? Well, I'm in Florida, so I would say it's very similar to being in a hurricane that just <laughs> doesn't go away. <laughs> a hurricane constantly. I like that. Hey, Sonia? Uh, I'm just liking wacky. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's, I don't really have, that seems to be the word I've been using a lot lately. Wacky. Because yeah. you're in the alternate universe. It's just, you can't even imagine what comes up every week. I'm with nope. It changes every week. Jacqueline, do you have a fun word? Sonia, that, Sonia, that's a word I use all the time, but I was doing that prior to this. So um, now probably the word, it has a hyphen in it, because of course I can't do anything simply. It's mind bending. Mind bending. It's been a mind bending time. I love it. Well, you guys have been great. We're right at four o'clock. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you everyone that's out there. And we really appreciate you being here for the eTourism Summit. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you very, very much.